Every ecosystem is loaded with tiny parasites, viruses, bacteria, fungi, animals, that are all invisibly feeding on just about every living thing. Many of you know a lot of these already by name. Ticks, lice, lice, leeches, tapeworms, essentially things that make your skin crawl. And in fact, our most common association with them is often when they make us sick. It's this association with human sickness that in fact causes us often to assume that parasites are all bad and they should all be erased. But I'd like for you to get to know them a little bit better, because beyond just making us sick and making, us, making our skin crawl, parasites have fascinating, far-reaching effects on organism behavior, ecology, and evolution, and they may even be very important in signaling to us things about environmental health. In fact, what I'd like for you to remember today is that parasites aren't always the villains. Many times, they're the heroes. Now, I'd like to start by telling you three characteristics of parasites which make them special and interesting, and yes, even heroic. And I think that these characteristics will help set the stage for understanding why parasites are so important at reflecting the health of our environment. So these three characteristics are that parasites are speciose. They have a lot of species. They're high in biomass and they're integrative. They link species within an ecosystem. And I'll go through each one of these in a little detail. So let me start first by, let's examine what it means for parasites to be speciose. A typical ecosystem has a lot of parasite species. Ecologists now tell us that parasites are the most common life form on Earth. Their commonality can be easily seen by taking a typical food chain perspective. This is a food chain like you might remember from middle school or high school biology, where you have a top predator like a killer whale feeding on a middle predator like salmon, feeding on a basal prey like zooplankton. And on the surface, this looks like a simple three-species food chain. But if we zoom in in more detail, we see, for example, that this top predator, the killer whale, itself has a load of small parasites feeding upon it. And the same is true for each level below it. So you can readily see how the number of species of parasites can add up in a system. So a typical ecosystem has a lot of parasite species. The second characteristic is that parasites tend to have high biomass. By biomass, I literally mean the weight that they comprise in an ecosystem. Now, biomass is important in and of itself, but it's also important because it signifies the appropriation of energy within an ecosystem. I want to give you a tangible example of the biomass of parasites because this is very hard to get an intuitive feel for. Parasites are often small and microscopic and internal and spread throughout an ecosystem. Fortunately, some colleagues of mine recently conducted a survey in salt marshes of Southern California and Mexico. They quantified the biomass of all the parasites and all their opposites, the free living species and they literally went in and weighed everything. And what they found was eye-popping. The parasites were three to nine times the size of the bird biomass. That is, the parasites actually outweighed one of the major predatory groups. Let me put that figure to you a slightly different way. In one of their small 100 hectare marshes, the biomass of parasites was equivalent to two elephants. Now, if this parasite biomass were instead packaged as two elephants, there is no way that you could drive by this marsh without rubbernecking and wrecking your car. But because this parasite biomass is typically parceled out into small internal microscopic bits spread throughout the whole marsh, it's easily overlooked and it's easily glossed over. But you now, as the savvy audience member, can recognize that parasites can be the elephant in the room. The third characteristic is that parasites are integrative. They link and connect species in an ecosystem. Now, the most straightforward way to understand this is that parasites, for example, can fatigue their host. And when that host becomes tired, it might be more likely to be eaten. In this case, a predator would greatly benefit from such a parasite that infects its prey. A more sophisticated version of this integration occurs through what we call obligate multi-host life cycles. 
In this case, a parasite actually needs several free living species to complete its complex life cycle. In my lab, we work a lot with a group of parasites called trematodes, or flatworm parasites. In this particular life cycle diagram I'm showing you here, this trematode species needs three different free living hosts to complete its life cycle. And every trematode species has a different suite of free living hosts it needs to complete its life cycle. You can think of these life cycles as roadmaps. This is how a trematode species would move from host organism to host organism as it grows if it's going to successfully complete its life cycle. And these really are examples where truth is stranger than fiction. So to walk you through this particular trematode's life cycle, it's very typical and also very illustrative. The trematode takes its larval stage inside a snail host. And it has a beautiful strategy where it doesn't kill that snail, it keeps it alive, but it converts it into a parasite larval production factory for the rest of the snail's life. Periodically, exporting stages of the parasite are shed into the water where they penetrate the tissue of a second host. For this trematode, that's a crab. But for a different trematode species, it might be a fish or a worm or another snail. And the parasite now forms a cyst, and that cyst can last for several months, and it's waiting for the day when that second host gets eaten by a final host, which for this species is a shorebird. The parasite can then become an adult inside the bird, and it begins making thousands of eggs per day that are shed in the feces of the bird as it flies all over the environment. And as those eggs are deposited back into the environment, they can be incidentally ingested by a grazing snail, and guess what? Start the life cycle all over again. So I find this really fascinating, because these trematodes have the requisite behaviors to move between these hosts as they grow. They also have to have the proper physiology to evade the immune systems of hosts from three different phyla. And they're doing all of this without a brain or any kind of complicated neural circuitry. Now, the most extreme form of integration occurs through a process called behavioral modification. In this case, it's so extreme that a parasite will actually alter the behavior of the host it's presently in in order to facilitate its own transmission to the host that it needs to get into to complete its life cycle. So here, you see a parasite which inhabits the eye stalks of its snail host. But this parasite needs to get into a bird host to complete its life cycle. So here you see it doing a creepy but astounding job of attracting birds' attention by making those eye stalks look like pulsating caterpillars. And it might not surprise you to learn that birds consume these infected snails at a far higher rate than uninfected snails. So let's recap what we've covered so far. Parasites are speciose. They have a lot of species. They're high in biomass, and they're integrated, integrating and linking free living species in a system. So thinking about these characteristics, my colleagues and I started to wonder, well, doesn't this mean then that parasites should be indicative of a healthy functioning ecosystem? And so we wanted to pose this question. Can parasites serve as canaries in the coal mine to signal a decline in ecosystem health? And you can see that by equating parasites and health, I'm really turning the typical perspective of parasites as disease agents on its head. Now, traditionally, if we wanted to assess the health of an ecosystem, the way we would do that is we would go out and literally measure everything that's there, counting up all the individuals and species. As you might imagine, that's a very time-consuming and expensive proposition. So we started to wonder, can we capitalize on these obligate multi-host life cycles of the trematodes? That is, can we go and look inside the snails and see what trematodes are present there? Remember, each one of these trematodes needs a different suite of free living hosts to complete its life cycle. So can we look and see what trematodes are there and then generate an instant inventory of the free living host species that we know have to be using that same environment? Because if they weren't, parasites wouldn't be able to complete their life cycle and they wouldn't be showing up in the snails. For example, if we go to a habitat and the gulls are missing, then any parasite that needs gulls to complete its life cycle is necessarily also going to be missing. So a couple of colleagues of mine wanted to try to apply this canary in the coal mine technique in a single marsh in Southern California. 
In fact, it's the same marsh that I gave you the elephant example for. And what they did was there was some marsh restoration that was going to occur. In particular, they were going to revegetate some areas of the marsh. But before this happened, they went in and they started monitoring the populations of parasites inside the snails. Well, the marsh restoration happened, and within two months, the parasite loads in the snails had spiked back up to their naturally high levels, high numbers of species, and high biomass. But what had happened? Well, it turned out when the marsh was restored, the birds came back. And when the birds came back, they restored all of those necessary links of the free-living species that many of the parasites needed to complete their life cycles. And as a result, the parasite numbers boosted back up to their naturally high levels. So this was very good proof of concept that parasites were serving as a good indicator of a healthy environment. Well, my student, Arit Altman, and I wanted to carry this to another level. We wanted to look at a much larger spatial scale. We wanted to look at the salt marshes of northern New England. So we sampled 15 different salt marshes ranging from Massachusetts to Maine. And within each of these marshes, we quantified everything that you could think of. We measured all of the biological attributes, so the numbers of species, their abundances, their sizes. We quantified physical attributes, like the flow rate of water and the size of habitat. And we quantified chemical concentrations. And, of course, we quantified the parasites themselves. We wanted to know what aspects do the parasites best reflect. And we were really excited by the answer. Because the parasites did reflect environmental health extremely well. As we expected, they corresponded very well with the abundance of their free-living hosts. But more startling was that the parasites were actually very sensitive to physical and chemical aspects of the environment as well. In particular, they were sensitive to human impacts. For example, the parasites were greatly depressed by high road density. The parasites also responded very sensitively to nitrogen inputs, which are a form of nutrient pollution. So these soft-bodied trematodes were actually reflecting human impacts more strongly than they were any of the natural factors that we measured, including things like water flow and habitat. Now, in the past, you might have reveled at the notion that some of our human impacts were knocking back the parasites, because you probably thought that we were killing the bad guys. But I hope now you recognize this as a finding of concern. Remember, parasites are the canaries in the coal mine, and when they start to decline, it can signal to us that something's not properly aligned in the larger ecosystem. Now, the more formal term for canary in the coal mine is a bioindicator. And our research so far suggests that parasites really excel in this role. And now you all are privy to the reasons that parasites excel at this role. It's because they have these special characteristics for which they're not often appreciated. They're speciose, they're high in biomass, and they're integrative. And as a result, they can often signal a healthy functioning environment. In a time when humans are affecting the environment in ways that we've never seen before, we need someone who can save the day. And that someone may just be a parasite. Remember, parasites aren't always the villains. Many times, they're the heroes. Thank you.